Greetings, everyone. This is Diego Sequera, fellow of the Samuel Robinson Institute for Original Thinking. We are now inaugurating a new session in, in English. Usually we do this kind of conversations in Spanish, but this time we're now taking it to, to another level and do it in English. We have been graced with the presence of a very special guest. Uh, with joining us is Dr. Buteina Shaban, a political and media advisor for President Bashar al-Assad from Syria. She's a writer, thinker, political, and I could even ask activist okay. in, a, in an intellectual sense and in, in any other sense also. Thank Professor you. Shaban, thank you very much for joining us. It's an immense pleasure for us. Thank you. Uh, I want to congratulate you first on all well, the recent events in Syria for the elections. I think it's something we look, we look pretty close from here and, and we know the importance of this kinds of, of activities and this kind of political response to, yeah. well, to Western meddling and aggression, but uh, we hope you can explain us a bit more about it. Yeah. So let's get to it. I'm going to start with a, with a question. Thank here. you. Thank you for your congratulations. And uh, I also congratulate you and Venezuela for uh, standing firm in the face of all attempts to try and uh, uh, create chaos in Venezuela. You, you show the great determination and the great will. And um, I salute you and the Venezuelan people and leadership for your uh, steadfastness and um, your uh, uh, really facing all the attempts with uh, great determination. Well, thank you very much. It's our duty and also we have, that's the only option. <laughs> Same Thank as you. you. <laughs> so, well, without further ado, I will ask the first question, Dr. Shaban. Well, a Washington think tank, let's call it influential, at least in their terms, uh, a year before the election said that the, the presidential elections of this year, 2021, were inconsequential and they must be ignored. But why should they be ignored and by whom? Who should, should ignore yeah. Um, I, thank you for this question. I think, uh, as you said, uh, <clears throat> about a year, year ago, uh, the think tanks and uh, power centers in the West started to um, really spread propaganda against the Syrian elections and that these Syrian elections should not be held because uh, the Constitutional Committee did not uh, reach uh, an agreement on changing the constitution uh, and, and because uh, uh, Security Council Resolution 2245 uh, was not yet implemented. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, meant to mislead people who don't know the reality. Of course, Syria has its constitution, uh, which was uh, uh, agreed by the Syrian people in 2012 and therefore the elections uh, uh, are due or were due uh, this time, and uh, they could uh, legally be done according to our constitution, and they should be conducted according to our constitution. But I, I think the Western forces did not want elections to be conducted because they did not want uh, the president, uh, President Bashar al-Assad to run for elections, and I think they know that after 10 years of leading his country against all kinds of terrorism, the Syrian people were most likely going to choose him. And uh, they didn't even want that. Even a few days before the elections, uh, the United States, France, Britain, and Germany said the elections will not be fair uh, or uh, free. And uh, I think it is funny that the countries decide before the elections how the elections are going to be. Uh, so we know what is their motive, uh, but the Syrian people and the Syrian leadership went, with this, uh, went on with these elections and thank God they were great success. Yes, absolutely. And these elections also came, the, well, uh, when the war against Syria uh, turned 10 years now, 
uh, it has taken many, so many shapes, so many forms in time, so many different attempts to, well, to achieve regime change, basically. But so, and also, in a way, elections also represent, I, I think this is also from the, our, our own perspective, the Venezuelan perspective, they represent also struggle for normalcy and the right for normalcy also, for a normal life. But uh, what does the election mean? Or could you tell us for the Syrian people, for the Syrian mainstream, besides the, the political aspects of it? Uh... After uh, the Syrian people uh, went to the ballot and uh, gave their votes uh, to whoever they wanted, uh, we were really surprised to see um, hundreds of thousands of Syrian people uh, go down to squares in all cities and um, in all small towns in Syria to express uh, their joy Uh, with the elections. Uh, I think all of us were surprised with that, but thinking about it later, after it happened, uh, I think it was a kind of expression of a challenge by the Syrian people uh, to all uh, the misleading uh, processes which were advocated by the West during the war on Syria. I think uh, through this occasion, the Syrian people expressed their anger uh, with all the aggression, all the terrorism, all the um, accusations which were leveled against our people and against our leadership. So I think the Syrian people took this occasion as an opportunity to tell the West that we are the ones who uh, give uh, legal, uh, uh, who, who give uh, justification for our president. You don't have the right to say who is going to be our president and who is not going to be. It is the Syrian people who decide and the Syrian people who decide both in Syria and outside Syria. So I feel that the Syrian people uh, uh, said their word Uh, to the West uh, by being uh, independent and leading their own uh, way of life and of system, uh, regardless of what the West wants. I mean, these uh, think tanks, as you said, Diego, they think they are influential. I think they are influential in their own minds. I don't think they are any longer influential on us because we discovered that They are neither fair, uh, nor free, uh, nor objective. And therefore, their credibility is very much under question. Yeah, that's right. Facts show, shows us this. Also, uh, another aspect of elections could be the overseas vote, exp expatriate votes, the people who, for some reasons, basically were Uh, or, or economic difficulties, economic challenges left the country, uh, but they were able to cast their vote uh, around the world. Uh, could you tell us, please, uh, what's the importance of this vote along with the vote of the people who voted inside Syria? I think it is uh, very important <laughs> from the point of view of the Syrian uh, government that the uh, Syrian people, wherever they are, Uh, have the opportunity uh, to cast their votes in these elections. And uh, the funny thing, Diego, is that uh, Western media was saying that uh, the Syrian government is threatening the Syrian expats to go and vote. And yet, they prevented our embassies, like in Germany and in Turkey, from opening to receive these votes. Well, if you think that we are forcing Syrian people to vote, oh, let us open the embassy and see whether they are coming to vote or not. You know, <laughs> test, test the will of the, of the Syrian people. But I think they knew in Germany, because there are two million 
Syrian people in Germany and they knew if the embassy was open to receive Syrian expatriates to vote, they will find long, long, long queues in front of cameras going to the embassy to vote. And they did not want this scene uh, to be seen by Western people. And so they prevented us from uh, uh, receiving Syrians to vote in our embassy in Germany and in Turkey. Wherever, in other 41 embassies, Syrian people were able to go and vote and they challenged all the uh, threats and all the, the blackmailing not to go. And they went and voted uh, and uh, uh, exercised their constitutional right uh, on this occasion. So it's important for us that Syrians both inside Syria and out of Syria uh, were able to participate uh, in this constitutional event. Yeah, it's another message, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So this might sound as an obvious question, maybe not, uh, because according to some people, they could say, this could be even a technical question. Is the war over? Is that statement accurate? No, the war is not over, uh, Diego. I think uh, uh, part of the war is over. I mean, there are so many layers to this war. There is the military layer, there's the economic layer, there is the uh, uh, media uh, layer to this war. So there are so many facets. Uh, and while, uh, while uh, militarily, Uh, most of Syrian land is liberated, but the American soldiers still occupy part of northeastern Syria. And the Turkish uh, army, supported by terrorist group, uh, still occupies part of northwest of Syria. And of course, the Israelis have their older occupation of the Golan Heights. And, and therefore, uh, of course, we have a long way to go to liberate all our land, but because, because the terrorists have failed to achieve the agenda, because of course the terrorists were uh, leading a war by proxy, they are only the instruments of these countries, uh, Western countries and Israel who targeted Syria. And once those terrorists failed to achieve their target, the American soldiers came and the Turkish soldiers came. So. Uh, it became a war not by proxy, but by their own army. But besides this, they started an economic war against the Syrian people by what they called Caesar Act, uh, which whatever they say about it, it is really a war crime against the Syrian people, uh, hoping that they will be able to achieve uh, through this what they couldn't achieve uh, through Uh, the, the military war, that uh, the military aggression that they led against Syria. But I think the Syrian people during the elections and after the elections have answered the West by, by their body language, saying that whatever you do, you cannot break our will. We are here to stay and you cannot uh, break our will by preventing us from Uh, you know, importing oil or, or whatever from, from preventing us from our daily needs. But our will will not be broken and we will go on fighting until uh, we liberate our resources. Of course, the Americans are stealing our wheat, stealing our oil, you know, uh, during the day under the sunlight, really. Uh, uh, and taking it to Iraq and then taking it uh, uh, abroad, which uh, a rugged state should do that, but not the United States, you know. Uh, yes, well, you already answered the, the, the next question. <laughs> no, that's uh, true, nobody. Yeah, no, it's perfect because that only makes me add up one thing. It's funny in a very ironical sense that they actually, the Caesar Act, projects the opposite because they justify this 
this act, which also would not only, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, not only affects Syria, it also affects Lebanon, for example. Yeah. Uh, as in, well, accusing the Syrian government in this case of being the one who are responsible of war crimes. But it's funny how, well, how you actually just describe how it works, how what's its purpose. So it's. Yeah. So it's well, I think, I think, as I said, that, you know, uh, there is a huge difference between what they say uh, and between the reality of the, of the matter. Of course, they say that the Caesar Act uh, doesn't mean that we can't import uh, medical thing or food thing or spare parts for our uh, airplanes, which, which is all not the truth. We can't import medicine, we can't import food, we can't import the spare parts, you know. I mean, they say things which are absolutely not true. The other day, an American said the, the Syrian oil is the property of the Syrian people, and we uh, do not have any right to touch the Syrian oil while their trucks are, are stealing, uh, you know, the, the oil from our land. So I think there is a huge difference between what they say and, and, and the reality. Caesar Act is directed against the Syrian people. It is really a kind of collective punishment against the Syrian people, uh, preventing them from getting their daily, daily necessary needs in the hope that they will turn against their government. What the Syrian people did is to show great support for their government and their challenge to those who are trying to break their will. Definitely, we can relate to that because they also say the same thing about Venezuela and about important medicines or food. For sure. And of course, they all, all the instruments that are <laughs> well used, the third parties or directly from, from Western states or during yeah. sanctions and executive orders and so on. Well, it's yeah. the same. It's the same. Yeah, it is the same. Dissonance. I actually always mention Venezuela when I mention what they do to us and to Iran and to Cuba, because it's the same what they do also to Venezuela. It is the same measures because they want, they, because Venezuela is so rich in so many things and, and they want the wealth of Venezuela. They want to uh, loot the wealth of Venezuela as they are looting, uh, you know, Syria. That's all what they do, because all their empires were built on the basis of looting our resources. And they want to continue doing that. And hopefully we will not allow them to do that. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct, Dr. Shaban. Yeah. yeah. I want to, this is something that doesn't go too far from the same mark, but it's another angle of the same story, same history also. And we're living history, of course. What about reconciliation? We know it's a process. It's not something, you know, it's not a, a simple one step A to step B kind of thing. It's about dynamics. It's about the, a living society. It's a living body. And it has taken several forms in time, starting thing, since 2012, I think, yeah, when the Dr. Tariani, I think, was the, the Minister for Reconciliation. And it has taken several steps. Yeah. Uh, where is reconciliation now? I think reconciliation is a long and uh, very important process. And uh, it started, as you said, many years ago. Uh, it started in, uh, at local areas. And it has also many different degrees. Uh, you have reconciliation at the local levels. Uh, among people who uh, were misled to fight with each other. And you have reconciliation at the legal level where the president issues uh, many legislations that find a solution for those who were misled to carry arms and to you know, move in a direction that is destructive uh, in the country. I think the important thing in this is the spirit of reconciliation, uh, that the spirit of reconciliation uh, uh, should prevail. And uh, this is what the government is trying to do, because as you know, 
Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who lost their sons uh, also in the battle. Uh, who um, so many people who who uh, died because of missiles that were uh, uh, hit hitting them uh, during the war by the terrorists and or by their agents or by their tools. So these people would say, how could you reconcile with those who killed our sons? So there are always two uh, sides uh, to this. Uh, someone is angry because they don't want to, to reconcile because they paid a heavy price in this war. But what we say to them is, what is the solution? We can't go on uh, in a prolonged and endless war. We have to find a solution for our people uh, to go back and uh, live together. Fortunately, most of those who perpetrated the crime were not Syrians. They were terrorists coming from out uh, of Syria. And therefore, most Syrians were either misled or they didn't know or, or you know, or they were really held as hostages uh, by in their areas by the terrorists. And that's why the president went and voted in Duma, because Duma was a, a hardcore place for the terrorists. But the people of Duma were held hostages by these terrorists. They were not terrorists themselves. They were not acting or killing people themselves. And so it's very important also to differentiate between those who didn't have any power to, to uh, fight terrorism and who were forced to stay under uh, uh, terrorist rule for that period and between the terrorists who were brought from all over the world to destroy Syria and to destroy the Syrian people. So, so the spirit of reconciliation is... Uh, is very victorious in Syria, and it's led really by President Assad and by the leadership that we, the Syrian people, uh, are one. We were always one, and we will always. I th I, th I think what I said is that what's important is the spirit of reconciliation. Yes, yes, we got because, that. Uh, because. Because what the West was trying to promote is that this is a civil war in Syria. And it was never a civil war in Syria. It is a war led by terrorists who were brought to Syria through Turkey and who were armed and financed by Western powers, by Turkey, uh, and uh, to try and destroy Syria and destroy the, uh, the joint life in Syria that we always enjoyed in Syria we don't have any racism, any sectarianism, and no, no one will ever ask you what is your religion or where do you come from, or you know th these questions are not important in, for the Syrian people because our culture uh, stresses living together in harmony throughout our history, and so they tried to break this harmony and to say oh, in, in all Western books or articles you will read the Syrian civil war, which is a big lie because this is not a civil war and there was not a civil war in Syria. There was a war uh, launched on us by terrorists and financed and, and organized and planned by our adversaries. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we can also relate to that. Yeah. So, in a way, we can say that reconciliation after so much violence, so much harm against the people would be like a, well, the reconstruction of the soul. Let's call it that way, yeah. of the soul of a nation. Yeah, yeah. But then we have also the physical reconstruction of the country. I think maybe a, a cornerstone, at least from, from, from where we saw it uh, outside of Syria was after the the, the Aleppo victory at the end of 2016. Then we saw how it was a, well, reconstruction was a meaningful part of, of what yeah. uh, the media, the alternative media showed about Syria. What are, this is two, four questions. 
which could be the main challenges now and what are the main achievements now at this point? Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I went to Aleppo about uh, uh, less than two months ago and uh, I was really surprised to find so many of the areas that were which were destroyed by the terrorists, so many of the buildings which were destroyed, of the, they were all rebuilt and people were resuming their lives on the way. Uh, the major obstacle in the way of, of reconstruction is the Caesar Act, because the Caesar Act is so vicious that it, it, it not only uh, uh, imposes uh, measures against Syria, but imposes measures against any party who deals with Syria or any company who would like to export things to Syria. And therefore, of course, many of the companies will be afraid uh, to uh, do uh, uh, business with Syria. Uh, and, and that is really horrible, especially as the Caesar Act or all the unilateral measures against Syria, they are illegal because they were not passed by Security Council. They are actually American sanctions decided by American government, by American Congress, and they want the entire world to obey their will. And if anyone doesn't, they will punish the same party just as they punish Syria. I mean, it is really the law of the jungle, if you think about it. Uh, no uh, no, no uh, uh, international system, no international law. Uh, they, they are the ones who decide uh, what, what, what should be done and how it should be done. And everybody has to follow. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, President Maduro uh, has started an initiative for all countries who suffer from unilateral uh, measures. Uh, and I think this is extremely important. I know that it started at the UN, like-minded uh, group uh, of countries uh, who, who, who stand against uh, these uh, uh, coercive uh, unilateral measures imposed on our people. And I just hope that China and Russia and India would be active in, in, in this format so that they, they stand against uh, uh, this American, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what I want to call it, this American crime really against our people and against our uh, humanity. Uh, so I think there's a huge need uh, to raise our voices and to work together uh, in order to change uh, the way things are done on the international arena. Yes, indeed. It's a group, uh, yeah, the group in defense of the defense of the UN Charter, which, yes, yes basically we have to recover this, also talking about spirit, the spirit of the, of the multilateral yeah. system of, the, of, of, of international legislation. That's basically what it's all about. And also, I think this is also descriptive because that would be like an outside uh, approach of the same, of, of the following question, if you allow me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. because they need to undermine from within, from the inside, to justify a, a narrative, a story, you know, a, a, a way to sell a justification for what they do. And yeah. also the, the, the Syrian experience, for, from our point of view, was, was a major example of, a, of even groundbreaking initiatives that the Western powers used to, well, to justify, to create, this is a new con concept, to create a reality, you know? And um, we can think, yeah. for example, one of the most uh, candid examples would be the traumatical sovereign transfer that, the, for example, the, uh, the white helmets represented, you know, as one of, one of several. Yeah. In time, especially yeah. with the benefit of hindsight, we've seen that there are, well, there were huge, massive, large-scale efforts to build this, 
to set this reality, to set the tone of this reality. Uh, what does this tell us about, for example, because also it focused mainly on quote unquote civilian aspects, this, let's call it a deception. What does this tell us about, well, the nature of the current wars and what about is, and the other question would be, is civil society also a, a battleground? Well, I think this is one point that uh, Robinson um, original thinking should pay great attention to. And uh, we all in your continent and in our continent should really uh, make uh, a very, very important uh, point about narrative. Because we discovered during the war on Syria that the war was launched at two levels, equally important levels, simultaneously, the military level and the narrative level. And, and the narrative level to convince the world uh, that uh, they are doing the right thing, that uh, uh, Syria is uh, being, uh, the Syrian people are being killed by their uh, leadership, and that they need protection and they need to, uh, they need help from the international community. I mean, they orchestrated a whole narrative, which, which all depends on lies, really. You know, they, they, they withdrew all their media agencies and they exchanged them for what they called eyewitnesses which is anybody to pay $200 to and let them write whatever you want them to write and send it to the BBC and CNN. The entire Western media depended in the Syrian war on eyewitnesses and on Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, who themselves depended on these eyewitnesses, which means there was no grain of truth in what they were doing. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, we, we now understand how they do things. And I think we should, uh, we should change our approach by also uh, uh, attaching great importance to our narrative and by making our voice heard, not only in our countries, but in the world as well, that people who do not know the truth start to learn from us what is the truth, rather than to remain victims to misleading narratives. Uh, of course, Western countries, they devote money, they devote planning, they devote energy for the media. We don't do the same. We don't devote the same means, but we should, because it is no less important than the military battle. Absolutely. Also, but also, which is pretty interesting, we have another aspect of this because, well, narratives need to be consistent. They need to be firm. They need to be- True, uh, true, true. And, when they don't have this aspect, this organic aspect to them, uh, cracks start to show, deficits of reality start to show, and even yeah. can reach scandalous levels. So this kind of, this brings us to, for example, what, what has happened with the OPCW scandal, uh, which is also a, a significant narrative battle going on, but- yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a distinct, I, th I think there's a distinctive aspect to this, to this because you can't fool the, all the people all the time, you know, like, like the Marley song. And, but something happens in the West, but is, the, is this that battle for, for, uh, for truthfulness? Is it, in this specific case, I mean, is it held in Syria or the global south, or is it more a Western situation, a Western battle that's being taking place? 
among Westerners? Uh, well, I think, I think, well, I think uh, the example of OPCW, which you mentioned, uh, showed us a very important fact that there are people, even Western people, who actually would like to convey the truth, but they are pressured by their own organizations, by their own job, by their own uh, bosses, uh, to confirm to what is to what they are asked to do. I think here, here the point is that we, as the people who are at the receiving end of these measures, we do not coordinate our efforts together. We, we, do not, we do not work together. I think the, 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 the major strength of the West is the transatlantic relationship. Now, now Biden is going to Europe, he said, in order to encourage democracies and to get together. I think the, their, their strong point is that they work together and, uh, and, and they show great solidarity even uh, when things are illegal, but they show great solidarity to each other. Now, countries like Syria, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, you know, countries who are bad, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, who are badly aff affected by these policies do not exert as much effort in order to coordinate and they do not even exert much effort to try and take into account the Western voices who support us. They find themselves lonely and sometimes they are isolated and they are marginalized because they don't have someone who supports them, who adopts them. They don't have terms of reference. So this is where our, our loophole is. This, is. this is where our weak point. And I think this is what we should address, that we, we should uh, join forces together in our narrative, in our work, in whatever we do. I mean, now with the, with the means of communication, we can always work together, even if you are in uh, Caracas and I'm in Damascus. We can work together and we can put ideas together and we can plan together. So this is, this is really what we, what, what we should do. Uh, the West has been manipulating this weak point uh, in us for decades. But the Syrian war showed us beyond any doubt that there is a lot of work that we can do. And I believe that the coming out of the Syrian people uh, was a very good answer to the West that they showed them in body language that we reject what you are saying, we reject what you are doing, we reject all what you are claiming about us. And this is a very good beginning for us. Absolutely. Uh, On the same level, let's call it this way, they also, this is the West again, they told us that, and I'm going to put a... a I'm going to quote unquote this, uh, the Kurds were the good guys, also quote unquote, which is also a very biased and, and, and well, uh, selfish definition of Kurds, but let's, let's go with it. Let's go with the Western definition they used in the Syrian context as the good guys. Uh, is it so? We've seen also what's going on now in, in Northern Aleppo, in Mambish, for example, uh, what can you tell us about this, this in particular? Uh, I think, you know, uh, Diego, I think uh, what the West wants everywhere, in Venezuela and Syria, everywhere, is agents. Agents to serve its own interests. And so anybody who accepts to be an agent to the West is the good guy. And by the way, not all the Kurds work with the Americans. There are two political parties, Kurdish parties who work with the Americans, 
but there are millions of Kurds in Syria who are very good Syrian citizens and who refuse to work with the Americans. But of course, the Americans refer to those who work with them as Kurds, as if all the Kurds in Syria work with them, which is not true, which is not true at all. Uh, so, uh, and even during the election, the Syrian people who are under the authority of Qassad, you know, the, the, they, they left the, the, these areas and went to government areas and voted. And now in Manbij, as you mentioned, uh, the, the Qassad wanted to take uh, young men to do military service for them. But young men in Manbij and, uh, refused uh, to go because they should only serve in the Syrian army, not under the umbrella of any separatist group. Of course, the Americans want this group to be a separatist group and to try and, uh, you know, as, the, as they are trying to do in Iraq. They are trying to partition Iraq and to curb Sunni and Shia. And uh, they are trying to do the same in Syria. But I think they, they don't know what they are doing because the Kurds in the northeast of Syria, they are only 20% of the population. And they will not, never be able to do that because the majority are Arabs and Assyrians and, and, uh, and the Kurds are very small minority. Um, they are only uh, using the support of the Americans and the armaments and the money from, the, from our oil that they are stealing in order to exercise power over the rest of the population. But, uh, you know, there's one thing, after this war on Syria, we are really liberated from Western assessment. We don't care who they approve of and who they don't approve of, quite the contrary. I think we are happy with the people they don't approve of. <laughs> This uh, this is out of, the, of of our plan questions, but I need to I need to if you are, if you allow me to make this question because it also I think it also links uh, the Syrian in the Venezuelan context in a very important way. But let's talk about opposition. Let's talk about what a political opposition means yes. and um, what they want us to understand or they want and how they want to impose as a definition of opposition, a political opposition in a country such as Syria or Venezuela? Well, I think, you know, if you have a political opposition that is nationalistic, that believes in the country, that is deeply rooted in the country, that is absolutely fine. You know, the, one of the uh, Syrian opposition was a nominee for a president in Syria. That's fine because he's a Syrian who believes in Syria, who has uh, an independent opinion. But the problem with the oppositions we have in Turkey or in Europe is that those oppositions who are paid by our adversaries, who live in five stars hotels and who are being paid by our adversaries and who only report to our adversaries. So they are not um, you know, uh, they are not uh, accountable uh, to the Syrian people. Uh, and that is the problem. But if you have a position that really fights for the country, wants the better for the country, wants the best for the country, then why not? You know, that's, that is uh, normal. But uh, I mean, would the United States accept an opposition that being paid by France, for example, mm -hmm. sure. Would they? Would the, would the France accept an opposition that is being paid by Germany? I mean, they try to to impose on us ideas that they would reject outright. They would never accept for themselves. You know, they 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 try to impose on us, and these are absolutely illogical ideas and we refuse them because they are not consistent with uh, one's um, you know duty towards one, one's country really like in Venezuela I mean they took the head of parliament and they said this is the 
this is an opposition and uh, you know how could you trust somebody who is uh, who is attached to the americans rather than to the people of venezuela i mean uh, yeah. the same thing in syria the same yeah it's, it's so many things in common <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> absolutely yes uh, well it's but also the same response i mean even with opposition i think we, we also finally find some some patriotic opposition that doesn't need to agree with with the chavista project but they're there and they're, no. they're there and they stated publicly without any kind of problem. absolutely yeah absolutely which is healthy in any in, in yeah case. yeah um you're a writer also You've published several books. Uh, also, I can I might add you you're a memorialist also because they are not all, not they're, these are not fiction or are not only uh, journalism in its own right. It, yeah. it also has a, a, a yeah. It bears a lot of your own experience as a translator, as a politician, as an advisor, especially with with well with with, with the late president Hafez Al Assad. One funny thing also, which is something I also enjoy when I was going through your work, it's, for example, with The Edge of the Precipice or the, the Damascus Diary, is how you break some myths that were usually stated about, for example, the peace process, well, the last peace process yeah. in Palestine during the 20th century, or, for example, the overdimensioned and infallible "Quote unquote role of Henry Kissinger," so this also addresses an important issue that's not only not only for as a writer, but also thinking about people who don't write but they do think and they do experience their own. They have their own experience about what's the role of memory here. What's the role of the memory in the people and in persons in general? I think I think the role of memory, uh, Diego, is extremely important. Uh, I, especially during this war on Syria, I felt, uh, of course, I never left Syria during the war. I was here all, all the time. And I felt that what, is, what they want to do really is to destroy our identity, you know, our historical identity, our civilizational identity, whether it is uh, um, crafts or food or way of life, or, or whatever, I felt that it is, it, my history is being threatened. And uh, I think we as a nation, the Arab nation, is mostly an oral nation. We speak a lot. We don't write as much as we speak. Uh, and I felt that there is such a huge need for documentation, that we need to document everything. Because, as you know, our Israeli enemy is trying to claim everything for itself, uh, just as the Americans and the Australians did with the indigenous people. They stole their civilization, their art. And I started actually a think tank called Watiq Watan, the memory of, 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 of the homeland. And now I have about 20 researchers and we are documenting. Our job is to document the stories about the war, the stories of the handicraft, the origin of the handicraft, the Assyrian language, the Christian uh, heritage in Syria. There are many topics that we are documenting because I feel that the West has been writing our history instead of us writing our own history, uh, you go to the libraries in the West and you find so many books about our Golan or about Venezuela, and you don't find the same books in our literature. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is also a loophole that we should really address. Uh, and so now I believe that also you have important personalities who lived a very rich life their experience should not die with them. We should document their experience and leave it for generations. 
this applies to music, applies to art, applies to craft, applies to, to many areas in life. In fact, now I believe every institution should have a branch for documenting. It's whatever it has, you know. You have the parliament. Somebody should document what mm. is being said in parliament because this is history. This is the history of Venezuela. Uh, young generations, future generations could dream. You know, they, they were not here to see what happened to Venezuela, but they can read uh, in, in, in the documents what has happened. Uh, so I, I truly believe also, I, I have the, you know, I always learn from my enemies. I believe that the West is also advanced in this. You, you know, Diego, in 1974, the United States has 1,000 centers for oral documentation. 1,000 in 1974. Of course, what do you and I know about the Native Americans, except what the Americans tell us? They document everything. They write according to their own ideas. And so our people should document their own lives, should write their own history, should preserve their own identity, document it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. why I, I attach great importance documentation of memory indeed absolutely which also bring us to our next question we're almost almost there <laughs> it, it, it has to do with something very important because it has to do well with Palestine and Palestine yeah. also uh, it's well it's built of yeah stolen memory in this case, but also of a memory of resistance, of resilience against this, yeah. this deal. Yeah. And um, the recent event last May, uh, there were uh, Alistair Crook, which is, well, I think it's a good writer, and I was defined it like the, the most recent events in Gaza and Jerusalem as the missile intifada. Yeah. Is there a shift now there? Is, a, is there, are we, are we witnessing a paradigm shift? I have things changed from uh, uh, previous events. Why? If so. Uh, I think we are. And for two reasons. I think we are witnessing a paradigm shift. And that's for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, in Palestine 48, and also expatriate Palestinians all over the world were one voice in this event in May. Yeah. And they were all united against what's happening uh, to them by the Israelis, what's happening to Al Masjid Al Aqsa, what's happening in, in Jerusalem, what's happening to the Palestinians. The second reason is that the young generation of Palestinians and Arabs who probably were born in the United States or Europe, they got the tools, the Western tools, and they used the, so the social media in a very effective way. And I think for the first time, they broke the monopoly, the Western monopoly on the media. And they had their own narratives reaching the ears of the world. And that's why you found so many demonstrations in Canada, in the US, in Britain, supporting the Palestinians. We have to believe that there are enough honorable people in the world who would support just causes if they knew about it properly, if these causes reach them properly. And this is our responsibility. But I tell you, Diego, I think probably this Palestinian uh, intifada would not have been possible if Syria wasn't the triumphant over terrorism. Like you have Cuba in, in Latin America, 
you have Venezuela with Hugo Chavez. Those inspire other countries and other people in your continent to stand up against the United States and to keep their own independent, sovereign decision. Now, uh, in Algeria, there are upcoming uh, uh, parliamentary elections in Algeria, and the candidates are competing in Algeria. So this also would not have happened without the Trump of Syria, without the Antifada in Palestine, without the big success of this May event in Palestine. I think we are reaching a tipping point, a turning point, uh, but we have to use it very well and we have to plan and think and, and, and use it properly with the means, with the, ra- with the correct means, with the right means. Yes, that brings up, I have, I, I had a question before this one, but I'm gonna, I think it's already partially answered because when we, when we speak, we talk about the, this common thread, thread with the, with the DA, yeah. uh, between Venezuela, Syria, Algeria, Cuba, Palestine. Yeah. I mean, there's a shared destiny there. It's not only, we don't, we're not only sharing the methods and the templates of Western aggression, we're also sharing a unity of destiny, whether we like it or not. Yeah. So I'm going to skip yeah. that question. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I would like to, if you allow me, I would like to quote you on a, well, we read it in al and I we read it in Spanish. I'm going to read it now, just a, a, a small, a short phrase uh, about, well, you wrote this in 2017. And this is a rough yeah. translation, of course, but I think it also has a lot to do with, 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 with what you recently said. And I'm quoting you here now. There's no doubt that the victory in Aleppo showed that the battlefield is a key factor to make political positions change. But thought, planning, and induction are the ones that should lead the battlefield in the first place, shedding light over the strongholds, making war loss lesser and victory far more brighter and radiant. What could those words tell us in 2021? This was was written four years ago. Uh, Yeah, I... uh... I think what what I mean by this again, I go back to our Western, you know, uh, adversaries who have thousands of think tanks and who also pay a lot of money for thinkers and planners uh, before the battle starts, and um, they they have strategists who put down for them different strategies, different scenarios. In in this new paradigm, in this new phase, I think we are are at the threshold of a new phase uh, in the history of the world. Uh, With China rising, Russia, the world is moving towards a multipolar system. Um, and uh, I think uh, each country and each one of us can play a role uh, in it. So I was, we were talking about thought and planning and induction. I think the West, you know, um, in, uh, in, in, in our Quran, they say first what the idea. So ideas are, are, are the most important. They are, they are the starting point for, an, for anything. Unfortunately, I talk about our region, about the Arab world. They don't pay enough attention for ideas. They don't finance intellectual centers, uh, research centers. Uh, you know, they, they are not used. It's not in our culture. While in the Western culture, they, they finance um, think tanks. They finance intellectual centers. They rely a lot. And they also attract talents from all over the world in order to produce ideas. While our talents migrate 
to the West, to work in the West, to give their ideas to Western countries. These, these issues are very important issues for, for, for the prosperity of our people. We, we have to give great values to planning and thinking and, and uh, elite people, smart people. Uh, and, and that's why I was really, really excited when I read about your initiative in Samuel Robinson um, original thinking, because uh, I'm sure uh, thousands of people in the world would join in this center uh, in, the, in the future. And we can do a lot of work together. When we compare notes, Syria and Venezuela, for example, we become stronger, we learn from each other. Uh, and and uh, uh, the fact that Western countries are against us doesn't mean that they are not advanced in many issues. Doesn't mean that we can't learn from them. We should learn from anybody in order to uh, uh, make fast steps to achieve our goals. And I, I always write about this. I think, uh, I think India was able to reach what it reached because it focused on the elite, on a, on, on a, and uh, we have to focus on people who can lead, on people who can produce ideas and, and also work together. Because as I said earlier, Western countries are strong only because they work together. Uh, uh, now, if Russia and China and Venezuela and Iran and Syria started to work together, uh, they become much stronger. All of them become much stronger. And, and so we, 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 we should learn to do that because uh, the, the system that the Second World War has produced is no longer reliable. It's, it's no longer um, good for us. We have to produce a new system, but we have to be active, not to wait for others to produce a new system for us. We should work hard to lay the foundation of the new system that's more fair, that respects the sovereignty of countries, the real freedom of people, the, the non-interference in, in people's affairs, all the moral ideas that we believe in, we should lay da them down in the foundation of the new multipolar system of the world. That, that's, uh, I fully agree. We've, we've I mean, it's not, it's not only, it's not only something I think, a lot of people here also think the same. And to yeah. build that common terminology, that interface that we need to, well, and, the, and to accompany this response to yeah. hard facts, let's call it that way. Exactly. I, Anyway, we're just, this is for wrapping up. I was, you also uh, actually answered another question I was, I, I wrote, but I asked, and I was like looking for this grandiose ending and there's no need to that either because already has been great, the, 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 the responses, the, the answers you've given us. But this is something that maybe uh, both of us as Venezuelans and Syrians could understand. And it's maybe a most, a more, humble approach to this and but also very meaningful perhaps for some people it, it's petty or small talk but not for us i've seen a lot of your uh, recorded interventions in, in well in the recent years and you say something that for example well we have we also say that uh, in several contexts and facing difficulties you say basically we will we'll find a way we'll find a way to this to solve this to we'll find a way to move forward What's the meaning of this? This is just to, to finish this wonderful conversation, Dr. Shaban. What's the, is, is there a deep meaning to this or is it, or, or, or its simplicity is deep enough to, at least I, for I us? Think, I think Diego, the meaning of this is what I have explained just now. Uh, when I say we will find a way, uh, I don't mean to say this and then go to sleep. We will find a way means we have to work hard. We have to think deeply. We have to learn what others have been doing. We have to check our weak 
point. We have to be brave in facing ourselves first to see where did we make mistakes and where did we succeed? Uh, what is the right path? Did we follow the right path or we didn't? And by nature, I'm a very optimistic person, but optimistic, but very hardworking person. So I always believe uh, when there is a will, there's a way about any issue, uh, no matter how difficult it might be, but uh, we always can find a way. If we exert enough effort, there is one word I love, which is persistence. We have to be persistent in pursuing our goals. In the meantime, to be hopeful that we will be able to reach our goals. Um, I think one thing that the West tries to uh, uh, inject into the minds of the Syrian people is uh, hopelessness, that it is a, a war, that uh, the West is so strong, that it has so many armaments, uh, that uh, we can't do anything. We are a small country, small people, limited resources. We should reject all that narrative. We should say we are here, We've been here for 10,000 years. We were able to defeat every single aggressor and we were able to defeat this aggressor now. So we find a way. That's what I mean. That's right. You reminded me, <laughs> when you say persistence, uh, Simon Bolivar, our liberator, 200 years ago talked about constance and to being constant as a, as a, as a main virtue, the main merit of any citizen that engages in the, in, in, in the struggle for freedom, basically, just, yeah. uh, just to sum it up. Dr. Shaban, it has been a wonderful conversation, a very insightful one, and it's gonna be Thank so you. helpful for this side of the world to also understand what's going on on your side of the world. And hopefully- Thank you. I hope this is not the first, the, the last one. I hope we, this is the first of many other engagements and conversations in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, reaching for me. And I'm very ready to be very active with you. Thank you very much. This uh, wonderful initiative. I'm really ready. And I always find the time to do such noble uh, things which need to be done. Thank you very much again. And Thank you, Diego. And we, and we take that, we'll take your word on this one too. Uh, yeah. Yes, do. <laughs> we'll, do. we'll do. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out to me and for taking the time and preparing uh, this uh, event. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been Thank an you. honor and a pleasure for me. All the best to all the Venezuelan to people, to President Maduro, to all of you. All the best. And same for the Syrian people and for President Thank Recently we, elected President Bashar al-Assad and, and you. yourself and your family also, of course. Thank you. And we will prevail. I have no doubt about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. So there you got it. That was Dr. Butaina Shaban and this first session, recorded session with the Samuel Robinson Institute for Original Thinking, please follow our social media accounts, follow us on Twitter, Telegram, YouTube, etc. I'm Diego Sequeira. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a wrap.